in this video something about testing bipolar capacitors. Here you see quite a bunch of them in my store, storage, and I've made that capacitor tester and showed the circuit in an earlier video. And perhaps it's interesting to tell something about capacitors and then especially the bipolar ones. So non-polar capacitors like these, all kinds of values, etc, etc. And in a capacitor that's well known for everyone interested in electronics. This is the, uh, the C schematic of a capacitor. There are two plates and because I'm only talking now about bipolar capacitors, so there's no positive or a negative, but two plates and the uh, surface of the plates here and here defines the capacitance value, but also the intermediate here in between could be all kinds of materials, air for instance, two plates with air in the middle or another material, ceramic or whatever. Uh, the surface of the plates and the ceramic material define the value of that capacitor. And the um, dielectric value of all the materials here inside between the two plates have a certain value. Uh, air, for instance, as far as I know, here you see two air capacitors. The air in between the two plates does not affect the value so much. As far as I know, correct me if I'm wrong. And also here we have an air a capacitor with an air dielectricum inside. So, uh, here is the, the page that I wanted to show, testing bipolar capacitors. I want to test a few of them here with my new uh, capacitance meter. And of course, uh, capacitors are always very interesting because of all the say strange things that can happen when you use capacitors. The dielectricum can vary, the surface of the plates can vary, uh, uh, the voltage for which it was uh, made can vary, etc. etc. And the most common problem with a bipolar capacitor is that there is a shortcut between the two plates. And in that case we have a, in fact we have a wire from one side to the other side and the capacitor will not, absolutely not show any uh, capacitance, only resistance. And there's a whole theory about ESR and when we are talking about capacitors, but I want to leave that ESR discussion completely aside. So here are a few types of capacitors, the air capacitor, you've seen it here, air capacitor. The air is the dielectricum, here the ceramic capacitor, and here we have the so-called foil capacitor. That's the way I name them, but the uh, D 
the electricum, so between these two plates, is made of, say, a kind of plastic. Whatever kind of plastic, mylar, PET, polyethylene, TF terite, uh, polypropylene or other plastics. And the good thing of these types of foil capacitors that they are not very temperature sensitive. And here you see two examples of foil capacitors. Another uh, family of capacitors is the so called are the so called ceramic capacitors. They are, by the way, all, as far as I know, correct me if I'm wrong, a temperature sensitive. And they use different ceramic materials between the two plates. So here one plate, the other plate, and that ceramic material uh, uh, has different properties. And here, for instance, you see a uh, 100 nanofarad capacitor and I'm absolutely not sure uh, what um, dielectrical material is used in this capacitor of 100 nanofarad. It works, it works up to 50 volts, but anyway. Here a 10 nanofarad capacitor is this ceramic? I think so because of, of the disk structure. That's an indication for ceramic capacitors and here you see other of them. It's a disk uh, and there's one wire soldered to one part of the disk. That part is often uh, metallized with silver or so and then on the other side of that disk there's the other wire. And uh, that is, say, the, uh, the typical way that ceramic disc capacitors are made. Is this uh, ceramic capacitors? Perhaps. I think it is. So 80% I think that it is. But I'm not completely sure, and I'm also not sure, about the ceramic material that's used in between the two plates. Here are 10 nanofarad ceramic capacitor. This is a tiny one. This is a big one. You will often see that uh, on higher voltages, the capacitors, the ceramic capacitors get bigger, get bigger. And this is a good example. Fifteen hundred, fifteen hundred picofarad at four hundred volts ceramic. That's what I assume. And it's quite big, but for instance, uh, 1500 picofarad for a lower value, it's also ceramic, looks like this. Oh, sorry, by the way, this is also one kilovolt. Anyway, they made uh, many types of capacitors in the past. So here also 1.5 nanofarad. This is a small one. Um, but anyway, there is a relation between the size of the capacitor and the voltage that it can endure. So uh, finally, something about bad behavior uh, of capacitors. The problems that you find when you solder out salvage capacitors of many kinds out of old electronic 
equipment that what I what I have done that's what I've done during the past uh, 30 years or so uh, some capacitors are bad and they show a strange behavior on the capacitance meter for instance you read a too high value compared to the value that's printed on the capacitor could be everything uh, say uh, 400 volts and at 0 0.15 uh, microfarad that means 15 nanofarad and uh, when you look on, on the meter, when you test it, you test such a capacitor with the meter, capacitance meter. Mm -hmm. uh, it shows, for instance, a too high value or a too low value or a very low value. And that means in many cases that the, com that the capacitor is damaged or shortcut. Uh, of course, when the capacitor is shortcut, we only have here a ohms resistance. Want to demonstrate that now? This capacitor 0 0.22 microfarad, 10 percent. Um, that's the variation of the capacitor value, made for 630 volts. But when I connect that capacitor to the meter, there is a complete shortcut. So that's very, very bad. I throw it away because this capacitor is damaged. It's like a kind of wire and it will surely not work. Here's another uh, example of a not proper capacitor 6800 picofarad. I put my camera down and now I connect that to the meter. Uh, six point zero zero picofarad but what I read on the meter is approximately 10 nanofarad here 10 nanofarad so that's a too high value compared to the value that's printed on that capacitor so I also throw that away. It is, by the way, a, a very good capacitor. It was a very good capacitor in the past. So German quality of the 1970s, etc. So when you do all these, when you find a lot of capacitors on a flea market, it's a good uh, idea to test them with the help of a capacitance meter and when they shortcut surely throw them away and look at the value that they give out that's also a say uh, indication for uh, uh, the capacitor health here you see some homemade capacitors made with foil and aluminum foil, by the way. That's interesting. I wanted to make a video about it. But uh, my camera runs out now anyway. It's interesting to make capacitors yourself by rolling up aluminum foil and plastic foil together 
and read the values on the meter. And you can also see in such a case that a homemade capacitor, but also uh, other capacitors made by manufacturers, well-known manufacturers, have a certain loss. This one had a certain loss of 11% when I measured it and tested it. So, pen over somewhat. I want to stop this video because perhaps it gets too long. Testing by polar capacitors is all, always a good idea before you uh, solder them in into a circuit.